This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Ahead of us today on this Thursday's programming, we start with Brian Lubers. He is an associate professor in the K-State College of Veterinary Medicine and a certified veterinary pharmacologist. And he's providing information on upcoming antimicrobial regulations outlined by the FDA and what these regulations will really mean for producers. Also ahead, K-State Water Extension Specialist Jonathan Aguilar discusses what producers need to know when it comes to making irrigation decisions, when experiencing drought conditions, and what to do when it actually rains. We end with K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd. He provides an update on a number of insect pests currently active in Kansas, including cicada killers and mimosa webworms. That and more awaits us ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We have with us now Brian Lubers. He is a K-State Associate Professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine and a Certified Veterinary Pharmacologist. And he also serves on our panel of experts for BCI's Ask the Experts, but also their Cattle Chats podcast. So Brian, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Samantha. Absolutely. So today we're going to be covering an important topic, and it's about the antibiotic regulation changes that are coming up. Yeah. So we've been through this for the last few years. Actually, about five years ago, the FDA published a document that kind of outlined their stewardship plan in animal and veterinary settings. And kind of the first big piece of that was the changes that we went through a few years ago with the Veterinary Feed Directive. And so now this is kind of another step in that stewardship plan. And specifically what it is, is the medically important antimicrobials that are still listed as over-the-counter are going to change over to prescription-only status. And so that would include things like oxytetracycline injectable, penicillin injectable products. There are some sulfa products that are labeled for over-the-counter. Those are kind of the big ones. There might be a few others, but those will be the big changes. And so now those products will require a prescription from a veterinarian. Sure. And hearing you list those products, a lot of those are commonly used when I think of what producers use day to day. Those are common products. They are. And again, we've, I think we've gone through, you know, people worry about, well, you know, will I still be able to access those medications? And certainly they will. But you say, I think a lot of the changes that have already occurred with the veterinary feed directive have kind of ushered this in where in order to get a veterinary feed directive, you have to have a relationship with a veterinarian. You have, and it's, it's a formal relationship. We call it a veterinary client-patient relationship or a VCPR. And so really with this change that we're talking about now, which falls under the FDA's Guidance for Industry 263, that's how this change is occurring, that VCPR is really the main component. So if you already have a relationship with a veterinarian, that's really all that's needed in order for them to prescribe antimicrobials to you. And it doesn't mean that you specifically have to buy your antimicrobials for a veterinarian. Veterinary prescriptions work much like human prescriptions, where if they're willing to write your prescription and you want to take it to a distributor, that is still a possibility. So a lot of the distribution channels will be the same. It just you won't be able to walk into a store and pick it up without that piece of paper. Sure. And I'm sure producers have a lot of questions on their minds, but the first and foremost may be what has led to this change? Yeah. And again, that goes back to the FDA has this five-year stewardship plan, which we're getting towards the end of. Like I said, the VFD and a few other changes have already occurred, but the basis is really the concerns around antimicrobial resistance. And you know, we can talk for a very long time about antimicrobial resistance and how much agriculture contributes to it and how much human contributes to it. And the short answer is we really don't know. The one thing we do know is that anytime anybody uses an antimicrobial, whether that's for animal uses or human uses, we have the potential to promote antimicrobial resistance. And so really this step is just making sure that when we use antimicrobials in animal production, that we're using them appropriately. And I think one of the things, when these changes occur, it's kind of human nature. We kind of take the negative aspect like, oh, this, you know, it's another big change. There are some situations where I think having a veterinary involved may actually improve the way a producer uses antimicrobials, right? It might be the suggestion, hey, I think this is viral or it's something else and an antimicrobial won't work at all. And you're just 
spending money that isn't going to help you. Or it might be, hey, there's another antimicrobial that I think would work better in this situation. I think in many situations, it'll improve the health outcomes that happen by making those changes. So again, I understand it's big changes and stuff, but I think there are some positive benefits that we shouldn't overlook. In terms of timeline, you mentioned that this directive that's been going on, it's at the end of its five-year period here. So when should this change really be expected to be implemented? So this change has actually already started. And so the way that regulations work, the FDA published a a final guidance, This, and I'll keep referring to it as it's Guidance for Industry or GFI 263. And if people are interested in reading that guidance, it's available online. You can do a web search for it. I think you said we could put a link in the show notes so people can actually look at what the document actually contains. But the FDA started a transition period. It was a two-year period. So the final guidance published last summer, so June of 2021. So by June of 2023, these changes will go into place. And the way that this works is the FDA is working with the pharmaceutical companies to change the label. It's a label change. And so before the labels were written, very plain language with no, what we call the prescription legend, which says essentially this drug has to be used under the authorization of a veterinarian. So the change is that statement will now be on the labels, it'll say. So that makes it a prescription product. Absolutely. So from going over to something that was, you know, obtained easily at a feed store or whatever you have it, it's now something like you said that you'll have to have a prescription for prior to purchasing those products. And it's just a label change. So that takes time. It does. Like you said, there's a short transition period. And really, you know, as far as the access goes, I think it's just a little bit of planning for the part of producers. If you already have the relationship with the veterinarian, just talk to them, tell them what you've been doing in the past as far as using these over-the-counter products so that they have an expectation of, you know, if we're putting together treatment protocols or whatever, we can put those products in and then we can make sure you have the prescription so that you, you can access them when you need them. Sure. And I think that's one of the concerns producers have had. They're like, well, now do I have to call my vet every single time I think I have a sick calf? But it really, it can be implemented in a protocol that you're trying to implement. That's as simple as it can be. It can be. Each state has slightly different regulations on what constitutes the veterinary client-patient relationship, which again, that's the foundation of all of this. And so But for instance, in Kansas, yes, you can absolutely do that. The VCPR is all about, is the veterinarian familiar with your operation and the management of your animals? Are they able to make at least a preliminary diagnosis um, that would say, yes, that is an appropriate treatment? And then then that veterinarian is available for follow-up. If things don't go as planned, if there's an adverse reaction or the treatment isn't working like expected, they need to be available. But yes, you you are able to do that through some version of protocol writing as long as it's planned and you have that relationship. Absolutely. And I think that's at the basis of everything that we encourage here at K-State when it comes to food animal production is having that relationship with your veterinarian. And hopefully this just continues to encourage that relationship. Yep, absolutely. And then in terms of where producers can see this going in the future, can we expect any more additional changes or do we think that this is the end of the road when it comes to this? I wish I had that crystal ball, Samantha. You know, I think with this, I think the Big changes have been made right now, either through the feed or through oral. And this change will include oral and injectable products. Everything will be under this. I'll say the supervision of a veterinarian to relevant to the discussion we just had about, you know, the veterinarian doesn't have to examine every animal. I think those are the big changes. There'll probably be some changes in the future still. I think this is an ongoing process, especially so the, the other change I kind of expect, I don't have a timeline for this, but all of this applies to what the FDA calls medically important antimicrobials. And those are, anim- and it's medically important on the human side. So it's which antimicrobials or antimicrobial classes do they use in human medicine? And then how does that relate to what we use? I think I would expect some changes on how some of those are classified. So the more important it is to human medicine, the more restricted our access to those drugs will be. And it could be things as simple as we aren't going to use it extra labely. We already have some products that way that even a veterinarian can't prescribe that. I don't at this point see anything that I think is going to be outright removed from the use, but I think maybe a little tighter restriction. So we're not using as much in some of those classes. I don't think this is the end of the road. Antimicrobial resistance is a huge public health issue, causes issues for us in in the veterinary side as well. So I think as we learn more and 
as we see trends in resistance change, either good or bad, I would expect changes in the regulations surrounding antibiotic use too. Absolutely. And I know the veterinary world is big into one health, that idea of the global health aspect. It includes all sorts of animals, but also humans in the same realm of things. So I know that this is a big part of that initiative as well. Yeah, it is. And and that's where the FDA as a regulatory body also operates under that principle, right? And they have a human side to the FDA. They have a veterinary side or animal health side to the FDA. So they are coordinating their efforts there as well. Absolutely. And I know you mentioned one of those resources before that producers could go to and check out if they wanted to learn a little bit more about these changes that they can expect. But if there's any more information that you think might be helpful to them, where can they find that at? I would encourage people if you want to, you want to read the actual guidance that the FDA published. It's not long. I think it's eight or 10 pages. It's pretty short, really. They also have a fact sheet that's um, frequently asked questions for farmers and ranchers. If you, again, if you web search GFI or guidance for industry 263, and you say frequently asked questions for farmers and ranchers, it'll pull up that fact sheet. And I think that's a nice, concise summary of what the regulations will be. And really a lot of the things we've talked about today are on theirs too. And then I, like I said, I will send the link to the actual guidance if people want to read through that as well. Like you mentioned before, that will be linked in the show notes of today's program, which can be found on agtoday.net. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Samantha. I appreciate it. And also, if if anybody has questions and they want to contact us, please feel free. We can post email addresses in the show notes too if you want. Absolutely. And I feel like this would make for a great BCI Ask the Experts segment. So hopefully if someone (laughs) has any questions, they can send it into that as well. That'd be a great topic for one of those. Absolutely. Well, once again, that was Brian Louvers. He is an associate professor here at K-State in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and he serves as a certified veterinary pharmacologist covering upcoming antimicrobial regulation changes that you can expect. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are back now with Jonathan Aguilar. He is a K-State Extension Water Specialist, and he's joining us today to discuss decisions that producers may be making and these drought conditions that we're currently experiencing, especially when maybe they get rain and they're not quite sure what to do. So, Jonathan, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, I think it is a very good, timely uh, conversation about the rain and the drought, uh, because I know that uh, depending on where you are in the state, uh, you might be having too much or too less over rain on your field now. But uh, yeah, I'd like to discuss about uh, for those that have options to be able to irrigate, what are the best practices and what are they should be looking at uh, at the moment when uh, we know that the mother nature sometimes brings us something different every day. Yeah, you never quite know what you're going to get here in Kansas, I've quickly learned. But in terms of some of those best management practices, let's start with your tip that producers really just need to make sure their systems are working. That is correct. Uh, It seems like it is a very well-known knowledge already, but uh, sometimes we are still catching some producers that still have some of their systems operating inefficiently. What I mean by that is uh, sometimes we see that the gear ratio for their systems are not correct or the pressure at the end of their system is below what was being designed. That means that uh, if you have those situations, you are not applying the right amount of water in your field because your system was designed at a certain pressure. And so those systems are going to operate optimally and will uh, will put in the water when that pressure is achieved. But if it is low pressure, for example, if the system was designed about an inch, then you might be only putting in about half an inch in some cases. And during this drought, that actually shows up, particularly when you don't get enough rain, that one quarter of an inch uh, adds up towards the season. And so you might be losing uh, 16 bushels per acre in that cases, just because we are not getting the the right amount of pressure. So one thing that we would like to uh, just remind the producers right now, particularly with the situations that we have in our uh, state, uh, is to make sure that their systems are working right and optimum level. Absolutely. You want to avoid as many inefficiencies as possible. Yeah, that is correct uh, because this is the time that uh, if you are not putting in that amount of water, as I mentioned, you might be losing as much as 16 bushels per acre, this, which is a typical an inch of water that you uh, that we associate with uh, with corn, so 16 bushels roughly. But it is also a time that you could see waves in your field. If your system is not 
pressurized up correctly, then it will show up also as uh, as waves in the in the field. So that means that the pressure is not enough to have an evenly application of that water. It's uh, when we say an inch of water over an acre, the assumption is that we are putting in a very even amount of water all throughout that acre. But if it is not properly designed, or the pressure is not right, or your system is not working, then you could see those uh, waves, meaning that very close to the system or very close to the nozzles, then you will get a lot more water compared when it is as, as you go out of the system. So uh, again, if you see some waves in the system, one is that you are make sure that your all of your systems are uh, operating correctly, particularly the pressure. Or if not, then this, this is also the time that you might be looking at uh, properly operating your system such that it is applying the water most op- optimally. Absolutely. And you mentioned seeing those waves. If producers are questioning, well, is that what this is a result of, is these inefficiencies? What should be the first step that they really take? So one of the first things that they should probably do is, one, is check their system if it is operating. Second is the pressure. It's a very easy way to check if their system is operating because typically they do have a what they call a chart in their system that shows them the operating pressure of their system. If their system was designed for, let's say, 10 PSI, and they are only getting 12 PSI at the end of the pivot, then that means that it is not operating properly throughout the system. It should be about 5 PSI higher than the lowest PSI or pressure regulator that they have. So they should make sure that they bump the pressure up such that it is above 15 PSI at the end of the system. Uh, The second thing is sometimes when they have a broken nozzle, they just replace it with with whatever they have in their their truck at that time. And it so happened that it might be a smaller uh, nozzle type than what what was used to be. Then it will show up as it is not applying the right amount of water. So check your nozzle packages, make sure that it is the right size for that particular span or for that particular section of the field. So those are the most typical um, and the most quickest way of, of fixing those issues. The other issues could be more towards the system itself, and that means that they might have to call their distributors so that they could check the system more properly. Absolutely. And, you know, it's easy to make those small changes where you're like, well, I've got this nozzle. This will work fine. It's easy to make that assumption. But like you said, those little changes over time can end up big result changes in what your field actually yields. That That is correct. And, and, and sometimes it's also deceiving because you will see that they are actually applying water. But in, in reality, when you all add it, add it up, it is not the same amount of water that you should be uh, putting in for that particular section of the, of the center pivot in particular. We mentioned some of the variability in the Kansas weather as of lately. And one of the things you wanted to mention was just not to rely on what your neighbors are doing. Because it's so easy to look next door and be like, oh, they're watering this often. Maybe I should too. But that's not the case. That is not the case. Yes. In fact, it is not a joke. Because according to the latest survey by NASA, we have found out that there is still a percentage or two of, of farmers in, in Kansas in particular that are relying on their neighbors to make their irrigation decision, scheduling it. Well, you mentioned about Kansas. Well, in Kansas, we do have thunderstorms, and a thunderstorm might be passing through a mile away from us, and so they've got about an inch or two, and uh, we are not getting it. And so definitely, it's not the same as our field anymore. So don't rely on your neighbor to make that decision. There are a couple of things that we could probably do. One is, if you don't have any anything else yet, put on a soil moisture sensors. That will give you an idea of what is going on in your field, on your on your particular uh, operation. The second, which is free, is by the use of of weather stations. Mesonet has a good distribution of weather stations, and one of the things that we are measuring is ET, or evapotranspiration, or the amount of water that is lost for a given crop. And we have an app for that. We call it CanSCED, and it could be accessed through our website, MILAB, or MyLab, KSU.edu, and it is a free app application for you to be able to match up what is being lost in your field, what you are putting in, and just give you an idea, okay, I probably have two more days to be able to shut off our system before I need some more moisture. And if there is actually a, a rain in the forecast, 
you could stop your system for a while and give space for that rain to, to get into your field. Because that actually helps us both on the drought condition and on the flood condition. Because if we are able to capture that rain, then there's no runoff, there's no flooding locally. But at the same time, if we stop also our system before the rain comes in, then we've got free water. So again, trying to, to address both the drought and the flooding issues in our region. Sure. I mean, it's easy to set a schedule on your irrigation system and just leave it, especially in drought conditions like this. We get so comfortable and we're like, we're never going to get rain. But then we those weather events do happen, like we got here in the eastern portion of the state not too long ago, and it catches people off guard. That's right. And even in the western part of the state, some uh, there were some thunderstorms that they're putting in about three inches of rainfall. And so those are three inches of free water rather than pumped water from the aquifer itself. So yes, uh, we are able to maximize the water that is being delivered to us by Mother Nature for free. But really, I guess another thing is just emphasizing the tool that a soil moisture sensor can really be for producers, right? It is, because if we put in a soil moisture sensor in their field, then we are trying to monitor what they have on their field, not on a neighbor's field. So there are two things that one should be looking at when you have a soil moisture sensor. One is that is there still enough water for us to be able to get through with irrigation? And second is how long could we stop our system before, uh, for example, if we get a rain or if we have a, an irrigation event, how long will that water maintain in, in your field? And in some cases, it will also tell us that we need to irrigate. And that's fine because this is, our, uh, this is a management tool for us to make a decision. So whether it says that we need to irrigate or we should stop irrigate, then there is something that we are looking at in the field to be able to help us make that decision. The other thing that I've heard from farmers is that it allows them to have a good sleep at night knowing that they have made a right decision. It also gives you a good a health issue for that one. Yeah, absolutely. One less thing to worry about when you rest your head at night. There's quite a few tools that we've mentioned here. So, you know, just keeping track of the weather itself, whether that's through the mesonet or some of the other weather resources that we have, but also soil moisture sensors. In terms of other questions that listeners may have, where can they find the answers to that at? Yeah, so we, we try to... Uh have a centralized website, which is the mylab.ksu.edu, M-I-L-A-B.ksu.edu. It's actually a shortened word for mobile irrigation lab. So if you are unsure about what that means, so mobile irrigation lab uh, at ksu.edu. KSRE in general is a, a good source, particularly with regards to water management. Water management does not only pertains to irrigation itself, but also to the crops that are being grown. Uh, for example, in our region, we are trying cotton, for example, as a possible rotation for corn, which typically is a high irrigated in demand. Absolutely. Great resources to check out for sure. And if you didn't catch any of those links, those as always will be linked in today's show notes of today's program, which can be found on agtoday.net. But Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share something for our producers out there. Absolutely. Once again, that was Jonathan Aguilar. He is a K-State Extension Water Specialist, sharing some important information producers should keep in mind when making decisions in these drought conditions when it comes to their irrigation. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. The recent heat across Kansas has been a perfect environment for a variety of insect pests. This week, K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd provides an update on several of those pests. Raymond, I think we're into that time when there are a lot of things to cover because there's a lot of pests and insects out there. Let's start with bagworms, then we'll go to cicada killers, squash bugs, and mimosa webworms. So like I say, a lot to cover. Yeah, we do have a lot to cover, Jeff. This is the time of year, heat, and of course, insects are cold-blooded. They respond to that favorably. But bagworms are still out there. The window of opportunity to deal with them is closing very, very fast because they're getting close to forming what we call the brown cap stage or sometimes the green cap stage early on, and they don't feed at that point. So applying insecticide is really not an option. The only option you will have is the infamous hand picking or hand removal. And there's some misperceptions there. I want to clear that up really quickly is when you do the hand removal, and it is effective, but only on the female bags. When you see bags with a papery case at the bottom, that's a male bag. There are no eggs in there. So in order to alleviate the problem of the 500 or 1,000 caterpillars for next year, 
you want to find the bags without the paper cases. And you pull them off the plants, put them in a bucket of soapy water, about a 1 to 10 solution, ivory, joy, palm olive. Let them sit there for 15 minutes and then put them in a very hot, dry area. And that should be pretty easy in most cases. <laughs> and that, that will kill them. And it has to be continuous, you know. But if you do that, just imagine psychologically you're removing 500,000 eggs for next year. Cicada killers, what can we do there? Okay, cicada killers are, let me explain what those are. So right now the dog a day cicada is out making the noise in the trees in the evening. And the cicada killer is a large wasp. But the female uh, is very docile. She will go dig a hole, sort of a nesting location in turf grass or managed areas or even open areas, open soil. She'll go up and grab a cicada killer adult. She'll paralyze it and bring it back to the hole. That's what she lays her eggs on, and that's what the larvae feed upon, basically. It's the males that get the bad reputation. The males are very intimidating and large. They they zip back and forth, and uh, people are very concerned. But you don't have to be because males can't sting you. They don't have the ovipositor or egg-laying device that the females do. So they are out there, which is really in conjunction with the, the dog day cicada. But remember, the males are just intimidating, and they're basically harmless. And this week, we will have an article in our Extension Entomology newsletter on cicada killers. In terms of squash bugs, still an issue? Oh, squash bugs are, let me say, Biblical proportions. Some people, uh, I, I've, in my years doing this, which is many, I've never seen squash bugs this bad in, in many of the gardens I visited and, my, and the producers I visit. And in fact, some areas have uh, close to 100% loss of squash because of the numbers. I've seen the red eggs. I've seen the young nymphs, the later nymphs. There's five nymphal instars, and then adults are out there. That is one of the big complaints is people have said they've never seen in this bad. And of course, insects cycle out, so next year might be different. But at this point, I mean, you can spray, but it's just, it's almost thankless. You can hand pick your vacuum, but in the insect world, it's a numbers game, and the squash bugs have definitely got the upper hand in terms of the numbers. And in terms of mimosa webworm, is that something that we're kind of adding to the list here? Yeah, mimosa webworm to me is a concern in terms of control because the window of opportunity is very narrow. The mimosa webworm is a caterpillar, primarily attacks mimosa and honey locust. So this time of year, if you see your honey locust with brown leaves or dying back, the insect responsible is mimosa webworm. You can't do anything about it. In early spring, you need to go out there like with a white piece of paper, knock the branches. If you see these green, wiggly, active caterpillars, that's when you want to spray. Once the leaves are folded up and they start turning brown, then it's really too late. If you have a large honey locust tree, mimosa tree, it would take several years of complete full, you know, damage, but the tree is not going to look very good the rest of the year. That's the timing. So you want, if you do have a history or you have honey locust trees or mimosa webber trees in the neighborhood, your area, you know, just be on the lookout for early spring for the caterpillars. Then you can spray some of our innocuous materials, meaning materials we use for like bagworms, like anything with spinosad. It's a bacteria that only kills caterpillars. And so you can use those early on as opposed to having to use something really, the, the heavy guns that are more toxic to pollinators and, and, and other beneficial insects. That's K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd with an update on several insect pests across Kansas. More information on bagworms, cicada killers, squash bugs, and mimosa webworm can be found online and at county and district extension offices. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.